Hi, this is Elizabeth Boyle, and you're listening to the Strategic Entrepreneur Podcast. Hey there, Strategic Entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 14 of the Strategic Authorpreneur podcast. On today's show, we're speaking with special guest Elizabeth Boyle about genre hopping. But before we dive into that, let's talk a little bit about what we have been up to this past week. Uh, there is a book I really, really am into. Um, the name is Crappy Rough Draft from Donna Barker, a friend of mine. Um, this book, it's, it's something special. Um, I would say it's very much uh, a book that uh, people that are starting out might need a lot. Um, and the subtitle is uh, very explicatory. It says, use science to strategically motivate yourself and finish writing your book. And basically, Crystal, that says everything about the content of, uh, of this book. Uh, you don't necessarily have to be like, just a new writer to benefit from uh, all the suggestions Donna uh, gives. What I found uh, very useful is like the science and uh, all the examples that she gives. And I can clearly see that she spent uh, a long time in researching all that stuff. And um, it's really like a, a way for writers to think of their work as a work in progress, uh, not beat themselves too much if they don't achieve exactly what they want to achieve how their mind work when you're talking about writing because when you're talking about writing it's a completely different kind of endeavor for anything else um, and she tells us to treat the writing as a very distinct kind of crafting which is completely different from anything else and our mind react to it in a different way so basically the book gives you the tools to recognize uh, when there is something that is blocking you uh, what are the things that blocks you uh, the most? And it gives also the tools and exercise to do practical exercise to help you finishing your, your first draft, the second draft, whatever it is that you are working on. So I found it particularly, particularly helpful for that uh, reason. Absolutely. I love that book. It is a great one to jumpstart if you are feeling stuck or you're not sure how and what to get to the next stage or you're trying to get some story idea out of your head and onto the page, then that is an excellent book to get you jump started. Um, I have not been reading this week, actually. What I have been doing this week is looking at what I need to adjust in my setup. Uh, so the tool that I'm featuring this week, I have two things actually that I've been working on. I've been just using my, my, um, my notebook and my whiteboard wall in combination to actually, um, make a list of any open circles. So, you know, when you sit down to work on a project and, um, you have these things kind of niggling at the back of your mind that want attention from you. So I have been just looking at what are all those little open circles or fiddly things that I've been thinking about for a long time. Oh, I have to do that. Um, in order to sort of make myself feel ready to dive back into the writing. So for me, I've been having issues with the internet, like most of the world at the moment, I think. Um, and so I ordered an ethernet cable and just got plugged in, figured out how to move the furniture around, how to get everything ready so that um, I could be plugged in, hardwired into the system so that uh, for recording podcasts, we wouldn't be glitchy. And so that if my husband and I both happen to be on a Zoom call at the same time, it still works for both of us and that I can still do research for my books while he is gaming with his friends in the evenings or whatever. So it works out well just to have that one additional piece of equipment and actually two additional pieces of equipment because if you're on a Mac and all the ports have been eliminated on the newer Macs, then you do need the adapter as well as the cord, which we have discovered in a two-step process in our house. And I'm sure we are not alone in that. So um, that's been one thing, just working on getting the infrastructure to all work. And um, 
the other thing was setting up an external hard drive for storing all my video assets because I'm about to work on some promotional videos and things like that for my books and also in podcast recording and developing tutorials for people to help with some of the content in my nonfiction books. What I discovered is that um, my hard drive, the way that iMovie, which is what I use often to edit video, stores everything locally on my computer and that just bogs everything down and makes it really hard for it to run. So I've been just working on getting my iMovie library moved to an external drive and making sure that anything I want backed up is backed up and that my system works with all of those pieces. And because we have all this equipment plugged in right now, it's very, um, there's like a big load on the system. So I've just been trying to figure out which things can I have plugged in at the same time and, and really tweaking my working process to be more efficient so that I'm not having to move things around, switch things, change things. And so that has has been this week's project in my world is getting my digital self together. But we are going to talk about, uh, in today's episode, we're going to talk about genre hopping, which is switching from one genre to another and various ways to handle that and some challenges that come out of that. And it, we have special guest Elizabeth Boyle, who is a many times best-selling author who's been in the romance industry for a very long time and did a genre hop or is in the process of doing genre hop into a new genre into a new genre, which is apparently harder to say than it should be today. So let's have a chat with Elizabeth and then we will be back to talk a bit more about that. I am very excited to welcome Elizabeth Boyle to today's podcast episode. And our conversation today is going to be about genre hopping. But first, I would love it, Elizabeth, if you could tell those folks listening and watching out there a little bit more about you, because not all of them know you quite as well as I do. So who am I and what do I do? I have been writing romance since the mid 90s, one book after another. And next thing you know, 20 years has passed and you look back and you have all these books behind you and you're just like, wow, how'd that happen? Um, and you have a career and it just kind of happens. You sit down, you put your butt in the chair and you write words and you make that career continue by writing more and more words. And so, how many, how many books do you have now? 27, I think, full-length novels, and then um, a couple of novellas and a couple of short stories. And what's the like average word count on a novel that you have? A novel is probably about 100,000 words at least. Anywhere, for, the earlier books were bigger because they gave us a little more room to write, but as over the years, they've kind of like first it was like you could go up to 125,000 and then it was like no no more than 100 and then they got real picky and started making us go to 90,000 and I tend to write long so I always felt like 90,000 was more like a short story <laughs> <laughs> to me 90,000 are you kidding I just got going at about 70 um what what are you doing to me you're killing me so so yeah. the fun stat on that is that is roughly 3 million words, wow. 3 million published words. So let's just take a moment and be excited about that because I think that that's something that, right? Like so many people are struggling to think of how they could get to, you know, a hundred thousand words, um, but 3 million words, that is a pretty epic amount of accomplishment. And you've been writing primarily in romance. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Historical romance and just mm -hmm. that and very focused on that, you know, in research and in terms of the genre and readers and everything. And so for so many years, I was so focused. I really kind of lost sight that there's a whole world out there of writers and other stories and other ways, you know, to tell your truth. And finally, when I got invited up to the conference in Surrey, and hadn't been to like a non-genre specific conference probably in 15, 16 years. And it was like, the first reaction was coming from romance, of course, I walk in and there's men in the room and it's like, men write? Wow, who knew? 
you know, when, when yeah. did that happen? When did they start writing? Yeah, and then you find out that there's poetry and songwriters and people writing fiction and nonfiction and memoir and science fiction and speculative fiction and fanfic and you're like really I, you become when you write in genre fiction and you write in one genre and one very narrow genre you lose sight of the larger world of words and that's not always good it's good that you're focused and it's good that you know your genre and you know your craft and you really study it but at the same time you're not broadening your craft and you're not challenging yourself in those ways that can make you a better writer yeah so so is that what prompted your genre switch or your sort of broadening your writing horizons or what was behind that decision to make a bit of a leap well part of it was it was kind of like two paths intersected um i had picked up the idea for this book in about 2010 and we were on a very long family camping trip driving across Wyoming and I'd written a book that never had been published and I, I don't know why that book came back to me while I was staring out the window at the gorgeous landscape of Wyoming but all of a sudden some of the characters from that book started shifting and I I could see it and it gave there was like this moment of just all these ideas coming together and all these threads that had been tugging at me for years all of a sudden knit together and I went that's how I tell that story that is how I tell that story and and it was about the same time when I started going to the Surrey Writers Conference and so it was this eye opening cross of seeing other paths and having an idea that was outside of my genre and it really was an idea for a book that wasn't really being written at the time and so it was like this you know this is a grand idea but it it does I don't know if it has a market um but it turned out to be an idea that wouldn't leave me alone so I kept I started just as I usually do when I have a story idea I started collecting on it research, um, story bits, um, dialogue. I picked up, I started putting it into a notebook, which is generally what I do when I have a story idea. Once it advanced to a point where I have more ideas and it's really starting to reach out to me, I give it its own notebook. And then when I have ideas or thoughts about it, I just write those notes and thoughts down in the notebook. So the notebook becomes the collection point. I'll slide pictures in there. I'll slide research bits, notes, write things. Sometimes I'll hear, I mean, even to the point where I'll hear something at um, mass or something um, in the homily or a conversation overheard over dinner. And those all notes go into the, the notebook so that when I do sit down to write a story, then I have this kind of beginning point of ideas. And I'm not going to use most of them, but they're just kind of those little sparks that say, this could be a piece, this could be a piece. Um, it's like having um, somebody take like four jigsaw puzzles and dump them all into one box, shake it up, and then you have to figure out which is which. <laughs> which are the pieces you can use for this one particular jigsaw and which are the pieces you can't use. So. Yeah. And so how does that work? Like, when did you know that this story was not going to be a romance? Um, I knew right away, right away, it was not going to be a romance. And that was kind of frightening in itself because here I am, I've got, you know, a, a kid that's potentially, you know, a couple of years away from college and, um, and a very steady income stream. And you kind of go, well, uh, this would not be a good idea to take, you know, a year or two or maybe three, as it is the case now, off to write this book. Um, so you, you kind of like, you'll, you'll step back and tell yourself, I really can't do this. And, right. and, and I, I shouldn't have. I should have been a little more willing to take that leap. But again, it was kind of the family life and the personal life and the writing life all needed to coalesce at this one certain point where it was possible. And, and then it finally did in um, 2017, 
got to the end of a contract, just realized that I had to tell the story. If I didn't write the story now, I never would. And that seemed the greater crime than going without an income for three years. I, you know, it's not that I don't have an income because I have royalties from old books, but in the same sense, it's not, you know, you just, you make adjustments for what you want in life and, you know, you just say, well, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to do that. And we're going to, you know, it, my, my you husband, make choices. You know, yeah, it's choices. My husband and I were both like, well, these are choices we can make and it's not the end of the world for us. Um, so why not? Yeah. I think there's, I mean, that's a point everybody's going to be at on a pretty regular basis as they're analyzing their author career is, okay, these are the options I have for the next step. What does that mean? So thinking about and talking about with, you know, your family, your spouse, your partner, whoever, um, what is this going to cost us to do this opportunity? And if you've got something creatively that's really sticking with you and, you know, you have to trust a certain amount, your instinct that that's a story that needs to be told. So but I'm curious because you are traditionally published in your background, like that is your sort of your business has been a, a collaborative one in that you work with an agent, you have traditional publishers, and that has been sort of how you grew your career. Um, how, how does that work when one says, oh, I think I'm going to write a book in a different genre. How, how does, how does that happen? How does that react? You to break the news to everybody that's relying yeah. on you writing. Okay. It, you just tell them because essentially they work, it, your agent works for you. Um, and, um, the publisher wants you writing books that you're enthusiastic about and that you're going to put your best work into. And it, it's your creative life. If the publisher, you know, the publisher is going to either be there for that book when it's finished and say, oh my gosh, this is fabulous. I want to buy it. Or you're going to just have to find a new publisher. And that's could be either the case. I still don't know that yet because I'm not finished with this book. My agent, on the other hand, was like, go for it. Um, there's all kinds of opportunities here. New opportunities are different. It'll be fun to try. Um, and she's kind of, she's a little more adventurous. So you just sort of, you know, <laughs> take that deep dive. I think it's more having the support behind me at home, which luckily in our marriage through the course of our, both of our careers, we have both at times had to ask the extra from our, you know, like my husband right now is going through an EMBA program and it's been a huge, huge ask from him for me time-wise because I've had to take on a lot of stuff over here because he's studying and working full-time. And so it, like I said, it was like kind of the perfect time for me not to be under deadline for books because then we weren't having this conflicting sort of thing. And there have been times in my career where I have just been had to be slammed and he's had to like either take time from work or um, allow me to travel. And when I was traditionally published, if I went on book tour, he would, he'd be on the hook for being at home for the kids. So we've always had that kind of cooperative relationship. And that's been always been a positive thing in my writing career is having that family support. Yeah, that makes a huge difference for sure. It and does. I think having having the support of your agent as well is also really good and that, you know, it, it's not what it's not another source of conflict because I think we get enough of the conflict in our own minds. We are experts at creating that as storytellers. It's all about ramping up the conflict. So it's it's pretty easy to see every way something might not work. But I'm curious. Um, so the new genre is what? Because I don't think we've actually said I, that. We haven't. Um, it is um, kind of, it's women's sort of historical fiction, women's fiction, um, with a touch of magical realism. So it's, it's a reach. It's going to find its audience or it won't. And I, I and that's about what I want to say about it. Um, Fair. I'm kind of keeping it close to the vest and cause I really am excited about this idea and it, it just isn't being written. So yeah. Okay. So I'm curious, as you're preparing for this, um, you've got an audience. I know you've got a newsletter list you've built up over the years of readers who follow you. Um, how do you, how do you, or will you, or how are you preparing for 
that switch or preparing readers for that switch or are you at all i i really haven't been um um a lot of my readers you know a lot of them just love rereading the books <laughs> so happily they still have you know they can sit and read 27 books over and over again but um also you know just kind of i've been hinting at it um they're where it's not a romance but they trust me enough that they'll be the things that they like about what i write and those things stay the same um you know humor characters who they can really relate to um the familiar characters that we all have in our lives that kind of make us laugh or, you know, make us tear our hair out. Um, you know, when you populate a town with people, you tend to kind of have these characters that are universal. So they'll, that they know what they'll get. Um, but I know there will be some that'll just be like, no. Um, I did that once when I was writing historical romance, stepped <clears throat> outside the box and wrote, two books that were his historical romantic romance but paranormal and there were a lot of readers who absolutely loved those books and there were uh, there was a contingency that was like don't do this to my historical romance so <laughs> you know there's yeah. uh, there's a real divide in the audience in historical romance and i i've always been very aware of that and you just I, I can't, I have to write what I have, I want to write. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell the stories that are singing in my heart. And I just kind of gotten to the end of the road on romance, historical romance. I felt like I had written everything that I wanted to say. That's not to say that I'm still not getting ideas for books and thinking, you know, that'd be kind of fun to write. But this one, I, I have to get this one out and then, you know, see where the road takes me. And so in terms of that shift in your mind of no longer being constrained by the rules of the romance writing, because there are very strict rules, uh, is there anything that's kind of surprised you about how you're telling the story or like that has become to your awareness that you maybe haven't explicitly thought about? I mean, after 27 books, a lot of things I would think become sort of internalized part of your process and when you shake all that up and you you don't have all those exact same rules like what happens what is that like well it's scary first of all it, you know it is kind of like jumping off um a cliff um and the comforts of a genre are gone you know like it you know when you write historical when you write romance specifically there's a framework there that you hang the story on and yet story is story and I think people read what they read because they want to connect with people and people don't change across genres. Um, the characters in a mystery novel are, you're going to find them in, you know, the nosy neighbor who wants to, you know, tell all or know all is going to be, can be in a science fiction novel, can be in a fantasy novel, can be in a mystery, can be in suspense. They all have the nosy neighbor. So. I think those things kind of cross everything. But um, I think one of the things was the, it, this glorious feeling of being freed from those constrictions. Um, and then that terrifying moment of that you're, you know, you just jumped off the airplane without a parachute. Oh, holy <laughs> folks, what did I just do? Um, it's kind of like the trip to someplace exotic and new that you maybe you know some island country that no one's ever been to or something and you're you know the first person to go there or something and and then you're driving along and you're looking around and everything's bright and beautiful and colorful and glorious and you come around a corner and there's a subway and a <laughs> you know you can go get your turkey sandwich or <laughs> golden yeah. arches and you're like wait a minute and that in a sense that moment is realizing that you still have to sit down and do the nuts and bolts of storytelling and you still have to do the writing it's not going to just magic you know it's not like <laughs> oh, i'm going to lay on the beach and the book is just going to come to me and i'm going to just type it out in these beautiful moments of inspiration 
No, you really just do have to do the nuts and bolts of writing. And that's the same no matter what you're writing. So mm -hmm. that answer the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it's just interesting. Uh, personally, I find limitations very freeing in a, in a weird way. Like if I can do anything, I find I often do nothing because there's there's too much choice and then there's too many ways you could do it. So I like the the restrictions of a genre in knowing what that is, but I like to hop between them. So that is, you know, I sometimes it's a mystery and sometimes it's a thriller and sometimes it's paranormal. And like I, if I feel trapped in a thing, then I then I don't feel like I can be my full creative self, and I find that really stifling. So um, it, it is nice to to not like to feel like you're choosing the thing you're working on is very motivating and it makes it exciting to get up and work on things and sort of follow that passion is so important. I think for the for for years um one thing I always did with every book I wrote was try to find some element in it that was going to be a challenge. Um something that would either make me a better writer um or like in one book I told the story and and in romance this is often very difficult. I told the story three quarters of it just in the heroine's point of view. Now that, you know, that's not done in romance. It's kind of a back and forth hero, heroine point of views. And I, but it was the only way the story could be told. You couldn't, you needed to stay out of his head. Her perspective was the only one that was going to work for three quarters of the book. And that was a challenge, but it was joyful because it wasn't being done and it was tricky and it, made me really think about my writing and my word choices and how I was showing scenes and how I was telling. And that was always something that I tried to do with each book was just find that element in it where I really needed to push myself and grow as a writer. And, and this is just like a great big grow as a writer. So mm -hmm. it's been a lot more challenging. <laughs> And I know you've, like over the years, you've built up a lot of really strong communities through those genre connections as well. So on the sort of writer community side of things, um, how how are you finding shifting is influencing some of that stuff or vice versa? It's kind of, it's kind of interesting because in some ways, you know, I still keep my ties in the romance community because they're my friends. I mean, they've been my friends for 20 some years. And, but some of the problems that they've been facing in like the last two years within the romance community, um, I feel very removed from it. And I, I don't feel like I have a voice in that anymore because I'm not writing there and what I've written is there and I can't change it. And so, but we still have the same connections as writers, you know, working writers. These are my problems or I'm doing research and this is what I need kind of things. Um, but over the past like 10 years, like I said, I've been expanding my deliberately expanding my writer connections and my writer community to include more people that have different experiences or writing different things. And that has allowed me to see a broader world. And I think that's really important. And that's one thing I would say about the romance community is that it is so insular that they don't they don't do a good job of seeing what's outside and how it's done. And if they did, it would be better for the romance community. So what I kind of learned by stepping outside the community was, you know, that there was a big fence around it. And I really got tired of that fence. And I mm -hmm. like my friends out in the other writer world. So <laughs> they just have amazing experiences and are interesting people. So Mm -hmm. so, but no, I have a, a couple of romance writer friends and we still chat back and forth on plotting and um, we call each other for help and keep those, those ties are just not ever going to go away. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Which is, is I think an important thing to remember both from the story point of view, it's a theme that's come up a couple times in this, that the characters are people at their core and the stories are about people at their core, regardless of the type of person or or who they are or what genre they're in or whatever like those those characters are ultimately just folks 
Oh, and that's true across the board. And the writers are the same thing. We're all just people. We just happen to be telling a certain type of story in a, in a certain time frame. And so that's, I think, a, a freeing way to think about it as well is just, you know, being people and writers together is a nice way to look at it. And then we can help each other in whatever way we can. And just like anytime you step out as a writer, you have to be very discern discerning about where you put your emotional or your put yourself in. Because as I took this step out, I was like, okay, I'm writing more of a kind of a Western sort of idea because the book is set in Wyoming. And so I clearly I need to join Western Writers of America and um, and I went to their conference and I have never felt more out of place and more out of step with an organization in my life. I mean, I, w I thought, you know, oh, I'm just going to go in and we're all going to be friends. And I was like, oh my gosh, I left that just like, what have I done? I, and so, but instead of just kind of closing the door on that and saying, okay, I'm going to go without a writer's organization. Um, I'm not going to have that. I kept looking and I found a small organization called Women Writing the West. It was actually an offshoot formed out of the Western Writers Association because it was a group of women in the, um, I think about the early 90s that just said, you know what, we don't have a place here. We don't have a voice here. We're going to form our own organization. And women don't have a voice. I'll be really honest. And women don't have a voice in um, the Western Writers Association. They don't. They get treated like second-class citizens there. And I know this is going to probably hack some people off, but it's the truth. I mean, to the point where you're sitting at a workshop and a guy will pat your knee. I mean, it's just like insane. Yeah, I know. I'm making a cringy face for the people yeah, who can't see me. So I'm like, just I'm feeling, I'm feeling that hand on my knee and I'm backing away. <laughs> you know, he, the man still does have his hand. I will say that, but he probably will not ever do that to a woman again. Um, and, oh Lord. But like I said, I kept looking for the right organization and I found, and even online, I was like, uh, this may be not my organization. It's, it really, because it was formed so many years ago by a mature group of women, as you can imagine now, most of them are in their seventies and eighties. So, but there's a small group of women who are younger, and that's a real relative term, <laughs> uh, and they're trying to, to build it as well. And it, when I got to the conference and I, I thought, oh no, this is just old ladies and what am I doing here? And oh no, but I actually met some of the most interesting writers I have ever met. And again, it's that stepping out of your comfort zone, trying something new, giving it a chance. Clearly, you're going to find out whether you like it or not, but you got to give it a try. And I wasn't going to go to the conference. And even when I, but it was close to my house. So I thought, okay, I'll go. And after I got there and again, went to my hotel room and thought, oh, I should just take a flight home tomorrow. I don't want to do this. <laughs> At the end of the conference I had found some wonderful women and you know and I I love 80 year old women they just they <laughs> not mince words I love them and they were so much fun and I went back last fall to and went to the conference again and I've continued to be part of the group and as long as you don't mind having to at least twice a month explain to somebody what Facebook is um, they're really kind of a sweet, wonderful group. And, but they have poets, again, poets, people writing nonfiction, people monetizing their writing in ways I never even imagined. Um, I met a writer who has written some Western novels and everything, and then turned around and took a lot of her research and turned it into a chuck wagon cookbook, and then took something else and turned it into a children's series. And it was, it was this idea of expanding as a writer and taking everything you use in writing and 
allowing it to monetize, which is something I had never thought of as a romance writer. Here's all this research I've done. Why wasn't I monetizing it the way these mm -hmm. people were on, all, all along the way? And that's that was kind of one of the eye-opening and light bulb moments of all this is that there are ways beyond telling a story in a novel to monetize all this work that you do. Yeah, I think that is a that's a great reminder for people who are sort of looking at their author business and trying to figure out, you know, times change, technology changes, everything is shifting so quickly, it can be a little disorienting. And in our mind, if the only version of having a publishing career is get an agent, sell the books to publishers, and then write the next book, um, there's a lot of missed opportunity there. And so there's definitely the I think the opportunities are greater than ever before in terms of the things we can do and how accessible it is to actually do those um, and to repackage we are we are knowledge workers as writers well, is really what we are providers we're content providers yeah. so there's constantly content that can come out of a project that can be add to the bottom line in a sense I as I've been putting this book together I'm also thinking of oh, what would be a companion to this and what would be some of the marketing opportunities to this. And there's, it's a whole different mindset. Mm -hmm. And it's one that I think um, publishers have been able to um, take advantage of. Now it's time for authors to do that as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, sort of, as you've seen the shifting uh, from really publisher focused publishing to more opportunities for authors to kind of pursue some of these pieces independently. Um, what are, is there anything you've learned that has really surprised you or that you've kind of completely outside your comfort zone, you've pushed yourself to do? Um, I, well, I think one of the, again, light bulb moments was, um, I had agreed to do two novellas for my publisher and, um, I had, kind of discussed one with my editor and she had said, Oh, it sounds like a great idea. And to me, that was like, okay, so write the book. And I was at a dinner with the, you know, the main, all the editors, and there were a bunch of authors there and everything. And I said, somebody said something about, are you working on that novella? And I said, it's almost done. And the head editor was like, what do you mean? It's almost done. We haven't approved that. And I was like, approval what do you mean I we just she and I the editor and I discussed it she goes well I didn't approve it <laughs> and it was that moment of power where all of a sudden I realized yeah but that doesn't matter and I looked at her and I said well if you don't like it I'll self-publish it and it was that shift in power and there was kind of that from the publishing side of the table collective <gasps> and the authors all looked around went well, hell yeah. <laughs> and it was a revolution. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you realize that there, you see that shift in power and you're like, I do have power. Yay. And that's been, that's empowering because mm -hmm. you don't have to put up with a lot of things you can say, you know, I'll self publish it. Nobody likes it. Yeah. It's not yeah. And never you said, you said earlier, like, it's important to remember that your agent works for you. It is oh, your absolutely. business, right? Like you are the author and it, it, there are a lot of circumstances where I think we feel like we don't have the power. And as creatives, we aren't running a business in the same way that you think of when you think, you know, corporation or whatever, but that's not in fact true. It is just as much a business as anyone else's business, regardless of what type of product you're delivering. And that's Absolutely. an interesting thing to to mentally shift and change the way you think about your writing and your stories and your content to that yeah. business mindset. Going in that vein, I think that's one of the things that I sh I have learned over the years is the one mistake I think I made was I didn't fire my first agent sooner. Um, and it was, I let the relationship continue for about four years longer than I should have. I should have fired her much sooner and I didn't out of, you know, some misplaced loyalty or whatever. Um, when they stop working for you, that is the time to say goodbye. And as a working author and you, if you have a track record or a publishing record, there's going to be another agent out there. 
Um, I took a year to find a new agent. I talked to everybody I knew. I came up with a list of agents I would never hire in a thousand years and a list of agents that absolutely I would hire. And please don't ask me for the list. I don't have it anymore. This was <laughs> years ago. But um, do your due diligence. And it was all the lessons that I had learned by not taking those steps earlier. Um, I put those to work. These are the things I want in an agent. These are the things I don't want in an agent. And here's my list. And I, at that point, sent out feelers to that list that the short list I had finally come up to and I had offers from all of them within 24 hours so you know never doubt yourself believe in yourself don't think you can't replace an agent or an editor or a publishing house you absolutely can um mm -hmm. your writing and your work is the best that you're provided for and the talent and the writing is there and you understand your genre and you're telling the best story they'll want you that if yeah. they think they're if they think they're going to make money off of you yeah they want you yeah and I think you know if you happen to be on the indie side of things that's even more true in that often it is a service-based business and you are literally hiring them it's not that they are getting a percentage of your revenue as you go. It's most often an actual service-based contract. And so there yeah. is that, that other mindset shift and knowing that you are the one with the power in that, that you are auditioning companies or service providers to help you with the pieces the publisher would have handled traditionally um, or the agent. You are, you are negotiating the contracts for things yourself. I mean, ideally, you're going to have a lawyer helping you out or at the very least be using right. templates and advice from professionals but you know i think that there is a lot of value in recognizing yourself as the ceo of your writing business and exactly. and steering your ship i had a i have a friend that is a very serious indie published author and she was like i got approached by this foreign you know a foreign language press and i don't know what to do and i was and I don't have the expertise in this. And I was like, well, you could probably hire an agent just to handle your foreign sales or to go mm -hmm. out there with it. She, she was like, I never even thought of that because her idea had been, well, I'm India, I don't need an agent. Well, actually she had an opportunity for more monetary gain by hiring this agent to handle just this segment, which is a very specific, specific segment in publishing. I mean, not all agents can't will sell foreign rights but some specialize in it and then you find mm -hmm. that agent and hand them over your indie and they'll go out and sell it all around the world yeah definitely. i just sold croatian rights this week nice yeah, i'm That's gonna be exciting croatia woohoo <laughs> <laughs> it adds to the language list <laughs> That's awesome. So do you, ha so do you have your back catalog rights back for some of your stories? And is, uh, is that, or did you just retain certain rights when you did your, copy? I have, I have three, my first three books back. Um, and the rest, I doubt I will ever get them back. You know, the contracts really locked me in. And, um, again, probably not the smartest thing. That was why I should have fired my agent earlier. Um, she was like, well, this is, you know, how it is. And there's no other way it's ever going to be. And it, I shouldn't have listened to her, um, you know, again. Mm -hmm. So, but the lessons we learn. <laughs> yeah, the lessons we learn. Again, um, making sure there's there's an out or a way to get your rights back. Um, I um, was looking at, I have some audio rights that should come back to me, but then they turned around and the publisher said, we have offers for those. And I was like, well, these offers are probably better than what I could get, go out and pay for somebody and mm -hmm. make the money back. You know, this is cash up front, so why not? And let them sell them. Yeah. I kind of have to weigh those things. Um, and if they do well, then I'll grab the rights from the other books and do it myself, have it done myself, but you just have to weigh those things as they mm -hmm. come along. And I think learning from each thing that you see happening is, is really important. And that's why the writer's communities are so valuable. And I think it's so important to, to surround yourself with people. They don't have to be doing the same type of book as you are. In fact, there's value in having a couple diverse uh, writers groups because 
you know, the things that the mystery writers are currently focused on might be different from what the romance writers or the science fiction writers are, are learning. And so it, it exposes you to more ways of doing things because the standards are very different in the different um, genres. Yeah. And, and meeting with people who are writing nonfiction and mm -hmm. again, poetry, songwriters, all these people have different perspectives or ways of doing things that are of course different but you can so learn from them so learn so much always be open to learning new things and trying new things especially with your writing and with your methods um when I started writing how I write when I started writing 20 years ago is not how I write now um or organize or anything it's evolved and changed and shifted over the years and you know, you just, you learn to try new things and what works you keep and what doesn't, you just, you know, kick it to the curb. Just don't even, don't even look back. Sometimes you'll yeah. look back and go, oh, maybe that will work now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So I have an unrelated, well, it's not really unrelated to storytelling because I think it does tie in, but I happen to know that you have a passion for creating yarn based things as well <laughs> and I'm curious to know uh how how that has intersected with your writing stuff so what kind oh, of I, I am an avid knitter um I've been knitting since I was seven years old and so I've always been a knitter um just off and on all through the years and to me I think with knitting it's it's such a meditative process it's um it just kind of empties you just empty out and you knit and I think that clears your head and clears your thoughts. And then when you come back, you can really focus. You, you kind of remove the clutter and then you can focus on what you need to do. And it's a stress reliever. Um, it also teaches you, like when you make a mistake in knitting, you have to pull it back. You rip it all out, rip, rip, rip. And um, you rip it back to the point where you made the mistake and you and that's part of writing is being willing to rip back the pages or rip out what doesn't work and go back to where you made the mistake being able to see that mistake being able to read your writing is much like reading your knitting you read you look back you see where you've made that error in your knitting and you just ruthlessly rip it out and then you fix it and then you redo it start over and keep going and being willing to do that will make you a better writer. People that write, have, write, leave mistakes in their writing are not going to have a career. You need to be able to go back, fix those mistakes, clean it up, and you know, make sure that when it's done, it's smooth all the way. And it's the same with knitting. Yeah, I think it's also the same in business, really. Like we can get paralyzed by being afraid to take a step in case we make a mistake or make the wrong choice. But when you can sort of look at your choices as, okay, I'm learning to do this. And if I make a, a choice that results in an error or a mistake or something that's visibly not how I want it to be in the thing that I'm making, I can dial back and undo because I mean, there are some things it's very hard to completely undo, but for the most part, you know, if you, miss a step or you forget to do something or your launch wasn't quite as organized as you hoped like there are ways to make adjustments to those things and course correct after you've after you've done them so i think just not being paralyzed by the fear you can unravel things and re-knit them together if you need right. to along the way and you can relaunch a book if it doesn't launch the way yeah. you want. totally you can relaunch it or you can try some other way to read. I mean, I, I keep looking at my books right now and I'm like, you know what? I'm just gonna like, there's a whole audience that has come up that has not read mm -hmm. my books. So to me, the goal now is how do I reach the readers that are 18 to 35 and share those stories with them? How do I get them in line? I mean, you know, after they're done watching Emma, come and read yeah. a romance <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely it's but you have um so it's an opportunity to relaunch a book um new covers or you know trying to find a different way 
to sell that story, you know, this, this blurb or this hook or this, this way of pitching this book didn't hit people, but you know, the story is something that they'll enjoy. If you just find the real hook, oftentimes when people say, well, which of your books should I read? The first question I always ask them is, well, what do you like to read? Mm -hmm. And then do that fast think, well, what book do I have that kind of dovetails into that? Oh, I like reading something with a mystery to it. Oh, well, then you should probably read um, This Wraith of Mine. Um, I like something with a little paranormal to it. Oh, read His Mistress by Morning. Oh, I like, you know, oh, I really like um, something where, you know, I like a lot of banter or mistaken identity. Oh, well, then you should read Love Letters from a Duke. So I have enough books that I try to, first of all, find out what people like. What are you looking for? And then, and then again, dovetail what I have in the backlist that's tailored. And once they take, put their foot in, then they're willing to probably take a leap and try something that's maybe a little outside of their, com their initial comfort zone. And so I think this is the same with relaunching is just finding that right way to introduce it. I mean, it's a basic marketing principle, right yeah. way to introduce it. You know, it's not new tide. It's the same tide that it always was, but we're just going to put flowers on it and call it fabulous. And people will go, <laughs> oh, look, flowers. Oh, that's the way I like my tide. Yeah, Great. I love that analogy. Yeah. Um, Okay, so if people are interested in reading books with paranormal or historical or some romance or some mystery, and they want to come find you, where is the best place to connect with you and your books? Probably my website, um, elizabethboyle.com. Perfect. And we will put that in the show notes for a quick and easy uh, click through to help you find some of those things. I just want to say thank you so much, Elizabeth, for taking the time out of your writing time to come and talk to all of us and help those of us who are maybe thinking about a little genre hopping and or looking at building a nice sustainable career that um, it does help to see how people have rocked that process. And what? Give us some what? Our time is up? How did that happen? I know. It just flies by. Oh. Whoa. <laughs> This is fabulous fun. Thank you for inviting me on. This was a great fun. And I mean, really, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm looking at my clock going, really? That was an hour. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, yeah, and I, I have a shelf with some of your books on it. So I will be in the rereading category until that new one hits the stands. And then I will check that out. So it goes without saying, Elizabeth, that was amazing, um, providing and giving uh, so much uh, great content. Uh, she's uh, a writer that has been writing for like a, a quarter of a century, I would say. So everything she said was gold. Um, I'll just focus on a couple of things she said, which I believe uh, need to be stressed out and uh, needs to be not stressed out it needs to be <laughs> underlined <laughs> that you can you can get that for the the very the very last part of the podcast when we make fun of, of ourselves but you no know, a couple of things that really need to be um underlined for me uh, very meaningful uh, which uh, i can uh, use uh, um, to explain a bit better why i think uh, they're useful um the whole episode was about genre hopping so it's basically another way to say going outside of your comfort zone, which is something difficult in any kind of endeavor, not only writing uh, wise. Uh, if we are comfortable writing in genre, we will tend to keep writing that genre, um, which is not necessarily bad, but what Elizabeth was uh, hinting on was that at a certain point, there are things that you, uh, lose if you keep doing that for years and years and years and in her case it was like more of a question of decades so it was interesting when she said outside of the community i was the romance community i started seeing some uh, um, some tendency behavior stuff like that that i don't necessarily liked um, anymore or i didn't um, feel they were 100 percent okay with me so that's when she started discovering other community the western community was one of them 
And uh, although there were some, some things she didn't like of these other community and things, uh, eventually researching other communities in that genre, she found something that was useful to her and to her book, the book she's working on now. This is major. This is important. Uh, when you are a writer and you're willing to push yourself uh, to uh, outside your comfort zone, good things start happening. Uh, the way she was explaining uh, her writing process, uh, for example, how seeing things from a different genre of perspective and these different writers uh, helped her seeing her book in a different light. So I would say the gold nugget that she was hinting at was uh, don't be afraid of trying different things. Because even if you're writing in a genre completely different from yours and you're not going to publish anything, in that genre, you will re-emerge from that experience enriched. You will know more stuff. And for sure, you're going to be using the new things that you learn in the genre you're writing. So it's painful in the beginning. But once you have those other assets and that other knowledge, that is going to be helpful to you as a writer in your career years from now. So. I really believe that's something that needs to be uh, repeated uh, because uh, what many writers that I know and that I'm following and that are successful, uh, they, what they do is now and then they will try and change uh, the things that they are writing. Um, I am always mentioned masterclass and you're probably going to be sick of uh, um, hearing uh, me. Uh, telling you that, but there is like a, one author that I really uh, like and follow, Neil Gaiman. He does change and shift uh, very often, and I do believe like his writing style, um, the way it's crafted, it is it was shaped because of this shifting between fantasy, science fiction, dark fantasy, children's book. He wrote a very different array of things. Stephen King also, if you think about that, uh, he didn't always and uh, only wrote horror. If I, if I say, for example, The Dark Tower, that, that's dark fantasy. It's another genre. They tend to do different things. Of course, mainly they stay in the same genre. So Neil Gaiman would be fantasy and horror would be for uh, uh, Stephen King, but they try different things. So what she mentioned, Elizabeth, uh, really made me uh, think about, the, about that. Uh, this was my first thing. I can say the second thing. Pause, pause for a second there. So, so let's talk about um, working in sort of experimenting a little bit. So when we talk about experimenting with your writing, um, I mean, it takes a long time to build up a career in a certain genre. So what are some of the reasons you think people might want to switch? Or have you ever thought about switching? I did and I am basically switching because every month I, I'm publishing a, a story that is different in genre. Uh, and I am noticing uh, first and what uh, Elizabeth was mentioning. It is, um, and forgive me uh, the word, but it's a pain on, in the ass to change every single time uh, the very foundation of the, of the writing that you are using. So from science fiction to fantasy, there are some things that you have to learn. Um, and there are some uh, tropes that uh, readers expect you to follow. So you, it is and can be very tricky because you have to be uh, able to uh, learn very fast. But what I'm saying is experiencing and experimenting. And bear with me, experimenting doesn't mean necessarily to write a novel in that genre. It could be a short story. So I would urge you and encourage you to write a short story or a novella instead of a, a full-length epic novel, if you will. But I am finding it on my own experience that by changing and shifting genre point of view and things, I do get to use different kind of tools. And most of the times, because I'm writing in so different genres, so many different genres, and nowadays I'm on an exploring kind of path. I'm still learning, trying to learn what I do like to write. I'm finding this exercise of genre hopping uh, to be helpful for my storytelling uh, abilities. Uh, I find that uh, if I write in one genre, 
hopping and doing something that is not drastically different, different from example, from science fiction to romance. But I can hop from science fiction to fantasy in a more easily uh, and trustworthy way. So when I approach the other genre, I'm more comfortable. I don't panic uh, that much. But again, Krista, that comes uh, with a lot of uh, self-doubt at the beginning, because what I would like to do is, especially at the, at the beginning, I wanted to say with science fiction, I didn't write a lot of fantasy before. Now I'm basically just writing different styles of fantasy, dark fantasy, fairy tales, uh, um, so this kind of thing. That's why I think it's useful. That's why I believe that what Elizabeth said might be useful to the people that are listening to us now. Yeah, and I think one of the ways that we define what we are is by defining what we aren't. And so it's much easier to look at a thing and say, oh, well, that doesn't fit with fantasy or that doesn't fit with sci-fi. When you're practicing deciding what genres things go into, you have to get really clear on what exactly does go in them um, and what doesn't. And I think that's a really valuable exercise for any author is if you practice writing outside your genre, you cement writing within your genre. It doesn't mean you have to release all those stories to the world or that you have to completely change your branding and go off in another direction. But I do think there's a lot of value in even just reading stuff that isn't your genre and saying, okay, it's these four elements. Like, these are the four things that make it a cozy mystery instead of a romance or that make it a fantasy instead of a sci-fi and having that discussion and defining that and talking to other people about what they think fits into that genre is also a useful exercise for you because it isn't, as we've talked about before, it isn't just about what you want to write. It's also about what your readers want to read and what is the expectation of your genre market and are you meeting those expectations? It's fine to be innovative. It is not fine to break the promises your readers are expecting because something is in a certain category. So I think from a, a strategic business point of view, you have to deliver on the promise of your genre with your stories. And in order to know which rules you can break, you have to first know the rules and you have to break those rules very, very intentionally for a purpose at an appropriate time and in an appropriate way. So I think that is a really useful exercise and something to keep in mind that you know, if you're feeling a little bit trapped in your genre and you've been writing in it for a long time, also just experimenting outside of it may remind you of what you loved about it in the first place, or it may be an indicator that if you're really loving the other things and not so much what you were working on, then maybe it's time for a little bit of a shift, um, even for a while, if not permanently, but just to give yourself freedom to flex a different set of creative muscles. There's another thing, actually. Uh... I listen to a lot of authors that uh, would say I don't write uh, other books in my genre because I'm I'm worried and I'm scared that I'm going to be influenced by that. I'm not necessarily agreeing with that statement. I do think the more you read of that genre that you are writing, the more you learn what has been done. So you can do different things. Uh, that's at least my my view on that. I do believe what uh, these other authors are saying they want to keep uh, themselves like maybe pure uh, uh, they don't want to be influenced but guess what like it's almost impossible not being influenced you are being influenced by everything that is happening to you, you that you like it or not you're a sponge so you might as well like suck as much uh, things uh, that you can so that your writing uh, is going to be influenced and be better by it and I think that that's a really interesting point, but I think there's a couple of ways you can use that to your advantage as well, is that you can, if you know that there are, you know, three authors in your genre that you write like, then read a whole bunch of their books in a row before you get into the, the writing thing. If that's a voice that you want to try to emulate or a feeling or whatever, then it can kind of train your brain into the length of the sentences and the length of the paragraphs and how the chapters flow from one to the next and how the story arcs flow. But I think volume is the key. It's that if you read one or two books, it's going to be too easy to just kind of subconsciously copy um, what's going on in those books that you read. If you read 20 or 30, 
then anything you produce after that is going to be a mashup of all of those things. So that's the difference between plagiarism and research, right? We joke <laughs> that if you take something from one source, it's plagiarism. And if you take it from a dozen sources, then it's research. And so I think that applies in your reading as well. And I, I definitely will go in and read a whole bunch of things. But I will be careful that before I'm about to do a deep writing phase, I will, I will read only the really good examples. And if I'm going to read stuff that didn't really work um, or read authors I'm not sure about, I will read them earlier in my research cycle so that I am not unconsciously emulating something that I didn't think worked. Um, you can read those, evaluate them, decide what not to do, and then read some good stuff that's really prime examples of people excelling in your genre and then shift into your own writing after that or even read your own writing if you're in a series I always reread the books in the series leading up to that one before I start writing in that series again because it just it gets my brain into the right mode yeah I think it's um, that's very meaningful um, there is another thing that uh, um, actually Elizabeth said uh, it's different from genre hopping, uh, and it's the more different than like going outside your comfort zone. It's a bit more extreme, and that's why I liked it. Um, she, at some point uh, in the interview, uh, she basically created a good uh, example with their, one of her hobbies. I believe it's one of her hobbies. Um, so it's knitting, uh, which is basically she does that on a regular basis. She really loves doing it. And there is something she said that I want to uh, just say back to you and, and uh, I want to say why it's meaningful to me and why I think it might be useful also uh, to you that, um, to you writers. Um, so she said that knitting has taught her when you make a mistake, you have to rip the fabric uh, apart and then you have to start over. You have to rip it back to the point when you made the mistake. And I'll be back to this point because it's very interesting. And that is part of writing too. Uh, be willing to read back the, pad the pages that don't work eh? and being able to see the mistake by rereading your writing. So there is, a, again, this beautiful uh, um, parallel between writing and knitting. If you leave mistakes in your writing, she says, you're not going to have a career. So that's why I was saying it's very powerful. Um, if read in a particular way, it might almost sound like negative, but it's actually not. It's very constructive, and I'll tell you why. Uh, at least this is my taking. When she compared knitting, her hobby, to her work, because writing is her job, um, she made us aware of a very important, powerful things that she does in both activities. When you make a mistake in knitting, and I've never done that before, but she was so good in describing that I can't understand what she was talking about. When you do a mistake, you make a mistake, you have to go back. So this is a fabric, you have to go back to the point in which it wasn't uh, a mistake anymore. And she, says the, she said the same. If you make a mistake in the writing, you're not doomed. You just have to figure out what is the point where things went wrong, very wrong. I do believe that you can apply this suggestion to your, your everyday writing. So if you are stuck, and this is interesting because if you can stand another uh, story from a masterclass, there is Neil Gaiman that says uh, similar things. When you are stuck in a point of your novel, 90% of the time is because something went wrong a few pages before. So you went to uh, the right instead of the left. So what you have to do, you have to go back a few pages and uh, when there was this uh, crucible, you have to understand the center, right and left. I went to the left, what's happening if I'm just going back and go to the, to the center? So exactly the same thing that Elizabeth said, but with the example of the knitting. And the reason why I also believe it's so powerful is that because it gives you the liberty of uh, thinking of your manuscript as something that is very fluid. You absolutely can go back and it's going to hurt, especially if you wrote three or four chapters in, but then you got stuck. You have to go back and probably erase those chapters, but it's for a higher purpose. It's for a higher goal. 
which is to finish the damn novel. And she did that more than once. Uh, she relates that she has this notebook with the, uh, which uh, she starts filling with the information and stuff when, idea, when an idea pops up and becomes bigger. There are so many times that she had to use her own suggestion. She was knitting the wrong way and she had to go back. So rip apart the fabric of your tail, in this case, if I can put it uh, a bit more poetically, and uh, realize what was the mistake when you made it. Reread what you wrote and try to come up with different scenarios and with different points. Um, if at this point you think the story is strong and it was working and maybe you are two thirds of the novel and then you go forward and there is something wrong, go back to that base one and try to go in a different direction. Try to knit, rip it, rip, rip it apart and then start over. Uh, creating a new design in this case. I really thought that was a meaningful crystal. Uh, I really thought that was a very personal, uh, but at the same time, very useful way of giving us permission to fail. Go back, start anew. Yeah, and I think as somebody who has knit, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not good. I am very good at making mistakes in all of the ways in the knitting. And um, it's really about and instead of rip apart, you can use unravel, <laughs> right? Unravel, because yeah. you, the way that it works is you, you, if you pull, if you take the needles out and you pull on one thread, it'll just come undone the whole way down the piece. Uh, I have unraveled entire scarves before, uh, and it makes a crinkly, crinkly yarn all the way down after all the, the uh, winding bits. But you're basically tying knots with sticks is what you're doing <laughs> when you're knitting something. And so, you know, if your story, if you're thinking about weaving together threads of a story, that is effectively what you're doing when you're knitting. You're just arranging them in different ways to get the look that you want on the front, right? The type of stitch you use gives a very different effect to the person who's looking at the finished product. So I think there's also an interesting uh, correlation is that often if you are having trouble with a storyline in your mind and you can't figure out how things work, actually physically knitting can help you sort of calm your brain and actually help you knit those pieces together in the story world as well. So it's a little bit of an aside, but I do love the knitting metaphor as what you're doing. You're choosing the colors of your yarn, you're choosing tech textures, you're deciding what kind of a finished product you want to have, and then you're weaving those pieces together in a way that is going to make the wearer or receiver of that knitted thing happy and excited and fall in love with the thing that you made. So it really is very, very similar. And, and I know so many writers who are also knitters. So I think that's an interesting parallel um, to dive into. So yes, thank you for calling out those things for us and now your favorite time of the episode we have our curious jar oh. you're looking more excited about these <laughs> rather than upset these days i'm so, just trying know. to go um you know scrap it off draft the potentiality of uh, yes this is not good but so i'm thinking that way now <laughs> Yes, and yes, and, uh, this is challenging for me, and I am going to rock this. Exactly. Okay, I'm going to sh shuffle my hand around in here. You tell okay. me when to stop. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop. Pink one. Pink one. Okay. Look at me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Would you write different stories or write your stories differently if you knew that nobody would ever know it was you who wrote it? Oh, that's super easy. No, I, th this is super easy. I'm the first one. Okay. Completely and utterly the same. Same. Same things, 100%. If I knew that there were reading or no reading. Um, and it's just because, like, <clears throat> when I write stories and if I didn't do it this way i would probably choose uh how do you call it in english like a pen name not a pen name like an alias when you are using that but another name how do you call it that's uh, a pen name pen name right yeah so i would use that probably uh but no the reason why i didn't use it uh, i probably could have used it uh, 
to write in English instead of Michele Mitrani, which is almost impossible, it seems, to pronounce. I would have used something a bit more Anglo-Saxon, but no, 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 no. Uh, the answer to that question is no, because, no, because, there is always a because. Uh, because I, um, even though, like, I know my writing style is not uh, at the point I want it to be, I want people to know that that's basically me. And uh, if I, if there was another way for me to write without people, people not knowing that it was me, I would be sad. I want them to know when I screw up something, even or when I do something right. Uh, so I'm curious to know <laughs> what about you? Um, I think there's definitely some stuff that I would experiment with differently if I was writing under a pen name, like a, a, a when I say a real pen name, I mean a pen name that isn't my real name. <laughs> because I have pen names, but they're yeah, all like legally names. me. Yeah, yeah I have three names that are all mine, so people still know it's me. I think because because I do have an interest in so many different genres, and I have gone through phases of being fascinated by crime stuff and criminology, and also like serial killers and you know crazy dark like medical stuff and whatever. I think I have a lot of really varied interests and. I would be interested to experiment writing with some of those, but they would definitely have to be under pen names that are not connected to anything else. And it's not because I wouldn't want people to know it was me. It's more just, I think, from a branding confusion perspective. Um, although definitely when you're writing romance and you're having to decide like how steamy are the sex scenes going to be, I think there is always a certain element of knowing like your family members and people you work with and, you know, my grandma, my daughter, my, my mom, like, you know, and then just random friends are going to read it. You have to be, you, you do have to be aware of that, that you are putting it out in the world. And I think there is a certain amount of limitation will say if you are using your real name on what you want to put out there not necessarily because you're ashamed of it or not comfortable with it but because other people react oddly sometimes to things that get put out and you get um either judged or people just sometimes take any writing of sexual content as an invitation which is creepy and horrible but it, it does sometimes happen so i think there's also that ingrained safety mechanism that just says don't invite this which is a whole nother slippery slope of a conversation but I think there is always that filter in the background of you know do I want to put this out in the world as me um is that risky for any number of reasons or you know will this compromise a future opportunity if I'm connecting what I'm writing to my professional identity, you know, how does that work? Because we're making decisions about ourselves in the moment, but you know, I'm only 41. So I think I potentially could have, you know, 40 more years of being active in the writing world plus, right? Like who knows how many, but, but still working also in a professional capacity. And so there is always that war of, okay, what is appropriate and okay now and what will be okay later and who will be looking at this body of work and making decisions about me down the road. And so I think as much as we would love to say, oh, well, that's their problem if they don't like it, we also do have to be aware as professionals in whatever industry we're working in that there will be consequences to some of those choices. And we may not know what those are going to be right now as the political landscape changes and as you know, society changes around us at an epic pace, it's hard to guess at what that will mean down the road. So I think, yeah, for me, there's always that little voice in the back of my mind saying, okay, does this work for who you might want to be one day? And that that does influence for sure what I write. All right. Whew. Well, there's a big one. So we would love to know uh, what would what would you change if you were writing stories that no one would ever know are tied to you? And you can tell us at strategicauthorpreneur.com on the comments for episode 14. So go ahead and visit us there. We would also love to add your questions to the mix in our curious jar. So you can email those to ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com and we will put them on a rainbow paper and put them in that jar to be shuffled up with the rest.
And as always, for show notes, links to resources we mentioned, and for coupons and discounts on tools we love, you can visit us at strategicentrepreneur.com. You can also subscribe to the newsletter. And each week, we will send you just one thing that we think will help you on your entrepreneur journey. And also a link to our latest episode. You'll get a gold star and a million bonus points in the game of life if you leave us a review or give us a star rating on whatever platform you are listening or watching this podcast on. It will help people find us and it will make us shiny but less new. And that is exactly what we're looking for is to have those ratings and make sure other people can find us and listen to the episodes. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy life to get to know us and be sure you subscribe so that you don't miss out our next episode where we are going to be talking about how to do a book sales makeover. So for those of you who were listening to our episode on transformation versus generation, we're going to go all in on the transformation part and look at how we spruce up some existing products that we might have and make sure we are maximizing every opportunity to turn that into product sales and dollar bills. Thank you and see you next week. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. out what the second bing is it's when i start recording okay the problem was that my not like random people joining us welcome to <laughs> it just bounced me to episode one where the heck did my google doc go wait they now said that's okay we'll try that again uh there we go let's, let's start it over over okay that, it's that kitting can you say it again knitting kitting knitting it's the k is silent so oh, N yeah N I T T I N G. Just pretend it's knitting. Knitting. But no, no, no. I meant like when you you are on top of something else. Uh, you're... Piggyback. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Piggyback. Yes. What is, what okay. Is so piggyback is. Piggyback. It's similar to me. Piggyback. Mm-hmm. When you piggyback somebody, you put them on your back and carry yes. them. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Or you're piggybacking one idea on top of another. Yes. Exactly. Uh huh. Okay, so who am I? What do I do? <laughs> These are questions that some days are more difficult to answer than others. <laughs> Strategic entrepreneur. Authorpreneur? Yeah, like author and entrepreneur. It makes for good outtakes. That's really, you know. Authorpreneur. Authorpreneur? Is that right? Authorpreneur. Yes, yeah, like author and entrepreneur mashed up. Okay. Authorpreneur. Are you ready? What am I supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, what are you still doing here? There's notebooks on your shelf. I know you have an empty notebook. You're a writer. We buy them like nobody's business. You see them on the shelves, they're on clearance. You're like, oh, I need another notebook. It's empty. Now it's time to go fill it. Pick up a pencil, go write the words.